It's now time for member statements. The member from Nepean Carleton. Thank you very much, Speaker. Rare in a city of almost a million people that its entire population would agree that one man was the heart, the soul, and the pride of its community. But that's Ottawa's Max Keeping. Born a proud Newfoundlander, he took the nation's capital by storm. Max never forgot what Ottawa gave to him, or for that matter, who he was. What he received, he gave back tenfold. He was a philanthropist, donating many hours and millions of dollars for charity, including our own Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. He was a children's champion. He supported organizations like Children and Youth Friendly Ottawa and made his newscast kid-friendly. It was the first in Canada to do so. He was a broadcaster, the public face of CGOH, now CTV Ottawa, and Max was a guest in Eastern Ontario homes during the supper hour news for almost four decades. He was a trusted face, even when the toughest news was about to be delivered. He was also a family man. He was devoted to his sons and his grandchildren. Although Max was the most important person in Ottawa, he never once had an air about him. Instead, he made every single person he spoke to feel that they were the most important person in the room. And when he passed last week, fellow broadcasters, politicians, NHL players, hospital CEOs, farmers, speaker, everyone had a Max Keeping story. He was a celebrity we all knew personally, and that was a real credit to his humanity and his humbleness. His life, how he embraced others, his kindness and his love of community is now our lesson, one which I know will be honoured by Max's family as well as all of us in Ottawa. On behalf of the Ontario Legislature, I want to thank Max for his lifelong contribution to the City of Ottawa, and I wish my most heartfelt condolences to his family and his grandchildren. There will never be another Max Keeping. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, member Statements, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to share reflections on two conferences I attended over the weekend in London. The first was Manufacturing Matters, organized by the London Economic Development Corporation, bringing together more than 400 manufacturers and service providers. This was the largest gathering ever of southwestern Ontario's manufacturing sector, demonstrating that manufacturing re remains vital to London's economy. The second was called the Future of Work, organized by the London Poverty Research Centre. Two leading economists, Armin Yalnizan and Mike Moffat, presented data showing that in Canada's changing labour market, a job is no longer a ticket out of poverty. In a region that has lost one-third of its manufacturing jobs over the past decade, this is a trend that took root early and deeply in London. At the first conference, we heard about the demand for skilled workers to fill new jobs in advanced manufacturing and the value of co-ops and internships to address workforce needs. At the second, we heard about the twin forces of globalization and automation that have led to plant closures, the displacement of skilled workers, and a generation of young people facing precarity as the new normal. My takeaway, Speaker, not only must we provide young people with opportunities to participate in paid co-ops and internships, but we must also support older workers whose jobs, whose skills are less easily transferred. We must create more affordable housing, increase childcare spaces, and build transit to get people to work. While doing everything we can to spur innovation, we must also ensure that no one is left behind, that every Ontarian has a place in the new economy. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to join the member from the P.N. Carlton in saying a few words about Max. Last week, Ottawa lost one of our true leaders, Max Keeping. Max was a journalist, a philanthropist, and a true community builder. As anchor for CGOH Nightly News, he found his way into our living rooms for over 30 years. And, he, and the news always included community. He had attended thousands of events for charity over that time. In his career, he raised more than $100 million. As a builder, he reminded us that all that community matters, and he knew how to bring us together. Max could throw a good party. <laughs> However, first and foremost, he was a champion for children. 
As a cheerleader for the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario and other causes, he helped us find our way to our pockets to support children's needs. Saving the cardiac program at CHEO, more support for children's mental health, or scholarships for children in care. He wanted every child to have an opportunity to succeed. I had the pleasure of working, uh, working with Max on many occasions, and it was never about Max. It was always about someone else. Communities need individuals who give expression to our collective desire that all of our children have a chance to thrive. Max was ours. Max, thank you for your unwavering commitment to our community and our children, to his family, our condolences. Max, we will miss you. God bless. Thank you. Remember, Stingus, remember from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. Falls in the air, and because it is, that can only mean one thing another round of cuts and staff uncertainty at Quinney Healthcare Hospitals. To make up for an $11.5 million funding shortfall created largely because Ontario's Liberal government can't manage money, jobs and services will be cut at hospitals in Picton, Belleville, Bancroft, and Trenton. Money is being spent on debt that people in Prince Edward Hastings want spent on the services that they need in their hospitals. This morning, we learned that in order to close the $11.5 million shortfall, QHC is proposing a reduction of nearly all surgery services at Trenton Memorial, $4.5 million in direct care cuts, and changes that one QHC executive calls very hard on our staff. During the years of this government, QHC has been the recipient of almost continual funding shortfalls from the ministry. So, Speaker, if I could, I'd like to direct some comments directly to my constituency back at home. The deficit this government is running is costing you your health care services. QHC has had to come up with $25 million in cuts over four years to make up for funding shortfalls because the Liberal government at Queen's Park doesn't have any money left. The government says money is going into better home care services, but the Auditor General says services are being cut there too to pay for, pay for fat cat salaries. The third largest expense in the budget is how much we pay to service our debt, and it's also Shame. the fastest growing. Thank That's you. why cuts like this have gone from being rare Thank to you. happening annually, Mr. Speaker. Good job. Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Bramall Lake Orville. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to raise the concerns of taxi drivers and limousine drivers across my constituency and across Ontario. Taxi drivers are raising concerns around Uber. Their concerns are that Uber perhaps doesn't pay HST, and that, which means lost revenue for the province and the country. They're concerned that Uber drivers often don't claim that income, and that's another source of a loss of revenue. They're also raising awareness and concerns around the fact that perhaps uh, Uber drivers don't pay for commercial insurance, which may leave drivers and passengers unprotected. They continue to raise concerns around the lack of training that perhaps Uber drivers may make roads more unsafe in our province. They also raise concerns regarding the lack of accountability that drivers are not accountable against specific complaints. Again, and finally, they raise concerns around the safety of vehicles which aren't subject to municipal standards. Our taxi and limousine drivers provide an essential and important service in our province. They are well-trained professionals who, whose vehicles meet municipal standards, and they provide an important service which must be respected by uh, this government. This government has a responsibility to address their concerns, and I ask the government to, cons to, raise, uh, to address the concerns raised by these drivers. They certainly provide a very important service. They are well-trained professionals that deserve that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to spend a little moment here to tell you a little bit what I did during the opportunity during the legislative recess over the summer. And certainly a great highlight for me was when the Premier of Ontario, Premier Kathleen Wynne, came to Beaches, East York. During her visit, we went to the Toronto East General Hospital, where she made a very significant funding announcement, $125 million over the next year for improvements for hospitals across the province, including $1.7 million for Toronto East General Hospital to renew its aging infrastructure. So the Premier and I toured the hospital's new and the very unique chest centre. It's the only facility in Toronto providing various lung health services under one roof. The new CEO, Sarah Downey, who's been there for about six months, is just doing a fantastic job. We then went on to Centre 55, a great community hub in Beaches, East York, and the Premier and I met some of the hundreds of, of campers from across the community. We were greeted by Debbie Visconti, Nancy Culver, and Jason Blagopol, who run the place. 
The campers were very interested in the Premier's visit, and they asked her lots of great questions, like, how did she get into politics? It was excellent. We then went down to Queen Street, where we went to the Beecher's Cafe. Thank you so much to Kumiko Martineau and her staff, who made our visit on the patio such a great experience. I was also pleased to take the Premier out for some main streeting on Queen Street East. We dropped in at Tory's Bake Shop, Arts on Queen, and the remarkable Bean, a wonderful coffee shop in the writing. But we held off on not going to the matinee movie at the Fox. Maybe we can do that another time. So my appreciation to all the residents and the businesses we interacted with that day. It was a wonderful, wonderful visit. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. I'm proud here to stand today to commend the organizers of this year's International Plowing Match and World Expo. Yeah. 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 Held in Finch, Ontario, in the great riding of Stormont Dundas in South Glengarry. What started as a dream for Stormont Plowmen Association, Association's member, Jeff Walbert, turned into the largest event in the history of Stormont Dundas yeah, yeah. in South Glengarry. Great job. Nice. I want to commend Jeff and IPM Chair Jim Brownell for organizing such a great and extremely successful event. Almost 83,000 people attended the 2015 wow. IPM. Good numbers. Good numbers. And the committee assembled over 1,200 volunteers. Excellent. Over $500,000 in donations and another 600,000 in in-kind work. Wow. The event was capped off with a terrific weather that allowed the visitors to take in all of the, the many sites. Whether it was the dancing tractors, the many coast. exhibitions, fire machinery, seat companies, service delivery companies, dealers of all kinds. It really was a great event, and it was a chance to showcase what we feel is the, the best area of Ontario, in eastern Ontario, oh, now, where people now. came down and saw the great crops, agriculture at its finest. And we're looking forward to next year. It's in Wellington, Ontario, yes. and it'll be another great event. Thank you. Great Go job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today to recognize a fantastic organization in my riding of Davenport, the Davenport Perth Neighborhood and Community Health Centre. The DPNCHC, as it is so fondly referred to, supports people in the Davenport Perth area who are suffering from economic and social barriers and empowers them to enrich their lives through the community. It also provides a space for people to meet and connect across all ages and cultures. From the Ontario Early Years Centre to the Youth Leadership Program for teenagers to computer training for seniors to the Edge West Clinic, this facility prides itself on providing services to everyone. On August 20th, I was honoured to invite Premier Kathleen Wynne to DPNCHC for a tour and host a community roundtable meeting with her and community organizations to discuss issues that we face in Davenport. Events like this show how our government understands the importance of health and community centres like this one, and I'm proud that to continue to uphold this commitment by supporting the DPNCHC through the Ontario Trillium Fund. Mr. Speaker, on September 12th of this month, DPNCHCHC celebrated their 30th anniversary. I was humbled to be a part of the celebrations and to see a whole community come together and recognize the wonderful work that this organization does for Davenport. I want to thank Executive Director Kim Fraser for leading this organization into its 30th year and ensuring that it continues to be such an integral part of this community. Thank you very much, DPNCHC, for all the work you do. Happy thank anniversary. You. Member Stevens, the member from Ottawa, Olyon. Last Thursday was the International Day of Older Person. As, as a former social worker and a co-owner of a retirement residence, I understand the value seniors provide to our communities. It is their contribution we can build upon and their guidance and experience we can learn from to improve our society. We must appreciate the contribution of seniors, the wealth of knowledge and wisdom they bring to our province and our communities. The Canadian population surpassed a milestone last Tuesday. For the first time ever, there are more senior citizens than children. Il est prévu que le nombre de personnes older people living in Ottawa uh, will double in the next 20 years, with a, pr a forecast of 500,000 people. So we have planned for this. That in 2013, the city of Ottawa was inducted in the global network of age-friendly communities by the World Health Organization. This is thanks to the city's older adult plan and age-friendly Ottawa, an initiative led by the Council on Aging. Excellent. With the first term of the older adult plan plan finishing at the end of the 2014, the city of Ottawa is currently refreshing the action plan for the 2015-2018 period. 
This year, the Council on Aging of Ottawa received over $18,000 through the Ontario Age-Friendly Community Planning Grant to collect data to measure the city's progress in achieving their age-friendly community goals. This is a great initiative on the part of the Ontario government, and I hope other communities take part and take advantage of. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. Now,